Uh, next uh, presentation of uh, Judge. I'm going to load it. And um, so Judge is a third year undergraduate student uh, from India. Uh, he's uh, in computer science. And uh, so he has all this computer background. In addition, he also joined the Polyastro project uh, some time ago. Uh, maybe you can tell more since how long, a couple of months or years. And I think that's uh, that's amazing story to hear because this is basically what brought you into, well, you said that you learned uh, about space using the project and in particular astrodynamics. And then you also contributed to it. So that's really, uh, um, the best case scenario, yeah, you, you take, you give, and it's all about sharing. And your topic is about space situational awareness. So that's very relevant for all of us because once we go up uh, as astronauts into space, we want to make sure not to get hit by some other satellites. Or maybe even more importantly, when we send our open source CubeSats into space, we want to make sure that they're not going to be hit by these nasty closed source proprietary CubeSats and other satellites that are flying around there. So your talk is going to shed some light on, on how to prevent that. And I'm giving over, handing over to you um, the presentation role and over to you. Okay. Yash. Yeah, thank you Atu, for the introduction. So hello, everyone. Uh, I am Yash. Uh, I was a Google Summer of Code student at Libya Space Foundation. And I was working for the project Polyastro, where we added a couple of event detectors. Uh, and I would just like to give a brief overview of the different uh, event detectors that we added and the results that came out of it. So even before we start uh, talking about the work that we did, uh, space events are everywhere. We, there might be various kinds of events, especially when uh, the satellites have been launching into space with increasing number. There are lots of uh, probabilities of satellite crashings or different kinds of events happening. Uh, there might be beneficial events. For example, in the case of satellite communication, if you want to communicate between two different ground stations, then you can have a satellite that uh, uplinks and downlinks data so that you can communicate between those two stations. And, but there's also a negative side of this. There can be disastrous events where the satellite can collide with other satellite, or maybe there's junk in space, I, I, or it might just collide with the attractor uh, on its attractor surface. So in such situations, we might want to have an event detection system that's, uh, that's robust and also swift. And so the work that we did uh, during the summer uh, was to search for peculiar points that is directly based on the classical orbital elements of the satellite. So the uh, whole thing now boils down to finding out zero crossings of the event function. So this event function would potentially be a function of the classical orbital elements. And our goal is to find uh, when did the event function cross this zero mark, as we can see here. And uh, the propagator that we use uh, for this event detection was the Cowell propagator, which is one of the propagators uh, in Polyastro. There are also a lot of other propagators, but we use this because, because it allows us to uh, model deviations from the standard two-body problem. And uh, there's also one more reason that it is the only function that uses SciPy's solve IVP function. So it was the go-to choice for us to do. And uh, the solve IVP function essentially just solves the uh, two-body uh, ordinary differential equation. Uh, and, uh, and each of these events would also have a terminate attribute and a direction attribute. The terminant attribute would signify whether we want to stop the propagation of the orbit once that event has been detected, or we want to continue propagation of the orbit. And the direction attribute would specify whether uh, the uh, event function is going from positive to negative or from negative, negative to positive. So it, the direction attribute also adds some sort of a physical meaning uh, to the whole event detection uh, mechanism. And the approach that we use was a point by point check procedure. By point by point, I mean that we check for event detection at each instant of time during the propagation. So we have an orbit, we propagate, and then again check for the event, and then again check for the event at each point of time. There are critics of this method deeming that this can be inefficient and slow at some times. But uh, as we will see later, we leverage a specific package called Lumba, because of which this is not so much of a problem uh, in our case. And ultimately, the goal of polyastro is to be useful for interplanetary missions. So it works with any attractor. So it's not just specific to Earth. 
you might have a satellite that orbits around Mercury, for example, then you can still apply uh, the events, uh, the, the uh, events uh, that you have developed. And just to give a brief overview of the module, uh, as is uh, common for all the modules in Polyastro, submodules in Polyastro, uh, we have uh, this two-body module that's a high-level interface, and we have the core module that's uh, that does the uh, fast computation that I was talking earlier. This core module would uh, make use of the number package because of which uh, these calculations can be done a lot faster. And the user is on this side where it will access uh, all of these cobalt propagator, which itself calls. Uh, which uh, which calls solve uh, IVP inside it. And so when we go from this high level to this low level module, we need to remove the units. And we, when we come back, then we attach the units. So that just gives a brief overview of uh, how these uh, modules have been designed. And now let, let's explore the events that we added uh, during the summer. So I've included the altitude and the lithobrake break event uh, in the same slide because they are more or less similar. So the altitude cross event would just detect when does your satellite crosses a specific altitude uh, from the attractor surface. For example, as we can see, uh, this blue line signifies that the determinant attribute is uh, set to true. So when it's, for example, at a threshold altitude of 50 kilometer, then the orbit stops. And if it's uh, orange, then it will just uh, uh, go on till the end, uh, till how much time you want to propagate the orbit. And and the special case of this would be a lethal break event. Just to clarify that this wasn't added during the summer, but we did change the interface of it so that it now becomes a subclass of the altitude cross event because it's just a special case of this altitude cross event where the, where the threshold attribute is set to zero. So for example, we know that the messenger spacecraft was launched by NASA and it was deliberately crashed into its attractor surface and so that it, it could understand the chemical properties of the spacecraft and et cetera. And so in such cases, this lithobrake event might uh, have some uh, use cases. And there might uh, also be other examples like defunct satellites that uh, crash into Pacific Ocean or any oceans on Earth where this lithobrake event uh, might be useful. And the next event that we added was the latitude crossing event. Uh, it detects whether a satellite crosses a specific latitude on its attractor. And again, to clarify a terminology that this latitude we are referring to is the geodetic latitude uh, in the case of Earth, or in general, the planetodetic latitude. That's just uh, uh, an equivalent version for any attractor. Uh, and we, we do account for the flattening of attractor because we know Earth is not uh, purely spherical. So we do account for that. And, uh, and so one might think that since we have added this latitude crossing event, so what about the longitude uh, at detector? Now, uh, since uh, we know that the longitude uh, increases or changes uh, in the east-west direction, we also have to account for the rotation of Earth. So at the time we were doing this latitude crossing event, we didn't have to account for that, and it was relatively easy to do. But for the longitude detector, it becomes a bit more involved. So we are taking some time uh, to, uh, to include this in polyastro. Then the next event that we added was this eclipse event we account for both penumbra and umbra regions of the eclipse. And again, it's important to uh, mention the assumptions and the considerations that we used. We do not account for the flattening of attractor in this case. For example, we do not assume that, we, we assume that the sun and the planets are totally spherical in shape, but we do account for the movement of bodies. As we know, the sun and the planet would all revolve around this common point called as the solar system barycenter. So we do account for this and we recalculate the position vectors of the sun and the planet at instant, each instant of time. So it allows us to uh, handle this scenario. And in fact, this movement of bodies would be, is in fact essential so that it can be used uh, during the propagation of orbit itself. And uh, to just show the eclipse geometry, that the previous diagram that I showed was just an extended version of those three, three points. But here uh, we can see the sun, the uh, central planet, and the satellite uh, is here. We can detect whether it enters a particular region or it exits out of a particular region. And uh, it just shows the uh, geometry of the uh, whole situation. And the next event that we added was this node crossing event. It essentially checks for the inclination of the orbit itself. So it's similar to the latitude crossing event uh, in terms of the description that we now check for whether the altitude, uh, sorry, whether the uh, orbit crosses uh, the ascending or the descending node. And the, it essentially boils down to che checking whether the inclination of the orbit uh, is zero or not. The next event that we added was the line of sight event. Again, to clarify our terminology, the line of sight here refers to 
the line of sight between two different satellites. So it's not between a ground station and a satellite, for example. And again, the approach that we use as of now is a simple trigonometric manipulations uh, due to which we could have some inequalities in the angles and we could detect whether the LOS is, uh, uh, occurs or not. And this might have importance in inter-satellite inter communication. And uh, let's say we, we have this LOS event uh, uh, inbuilt in a system. So we might uh, do further sophisticated analysis on top of that. For example, we could have uh, a radar system technology that could uh, find distance between two different satellites uh, once we know that they are in the line of sight. And the whole point of all of these events is to give an interface so that people could uh, use it for further analysis or more sophisticated treatment as well. And the work was not done yet. We needed to validate all of these events. And for this, um, uh, we used the ORCID library. Unfortunately, it's it in Java. But again, thanks to the ORCID Python wrapper, we could use a Python code to uh, test both ORCID and the polyastro orbits. And the methodology for this would be uh, it, it's simple. We just propagate both the ORCID and the polyastro orbits and match the uh, time of the event occurrence. And the result that we got was that the time difference is more or less less than two or three seconds. We have, uh, as of now, we have set a threshold of five seconds at the maximum because you know, because both of the ORCID and polyastro event detection mechanisms are different. So there might be some uh, sort of differences uh, in both of the implementation. But as of now, it, it, it serves as a, a good first uh, implementation. And so if we want, let's say, sub-second accuracy or something like that, then we might also consider making this more accurate and more robust, for example. And I also want to say that there are other approaches to event detection. Uh, and the, we wanted to have those in the scope of polyastro. But there are also other event detection approaches that are done in literature. For example, we could do an anomaly detection approach on the time series that is generated from the two lined element sets uh, of the orbital elements. So for example, in this Li and Chen paper, uh, this, they uh, classify these anomalous points that are shown in red as uh, the potential points of, uh, as potential events. And so th this graph shows the semi-major axis uh, plotted in terms of time. So there's this one approach. And th there are also several approaches that we could use. Uh, for example, we might have weather satellites, uh, or we might, we might have satellites that are measuring the temperature in its surroundings. And we could use uh, event detection mechanisms in, in, in a whole, whole lot of uh, different scenarios. But the goal of uh, event detection module in polyastro was to have the simple event detection mechanisms that could be used for uh, any satellite that has a predefined uh, orbit. And the work is not over yet. There are lots of event detectors that we are thinking of, uh, some of which are already in progress. For example, the satellite visibility uh, event. For example, it, it checks whether uh, a satellite is visible from a ground station or not. And, of, and also the attractor surface visibility. It checks whether a satellite can see a particular point on uh, in its attractor surface or not. So these are events that are currently in progress. And we're also thinking of uh, further events, for example, whether two, two satellites would collide or not. So these are a bit more ambitious for, for us right now. These were, we were thinking of these events, but uh, we couldn't do uh, in the time frame of Google Summer of Code, but we hope to add them soon in Polyastro so that uh, we get a more uh, we get more variety in the event detection models that are being added so far. And thank you. That's what uh, I had to say about the event detection mechanisms. We are, we are obviously looking for suggestions, ideas, and bugs, and we would love to hear any suggestions or ideas that you might have. You might come into the Polyastro's issue tracker and just put it put down your suggestions or ideas that you might have uh, ideas for uh, even events that are going to be added or events that have already been added and we're all also looking for that and uh, finally it's a big thank you to labor space foundation for giving me this opportunity to work at google summer of code and also uh, for to my two mentors huan lu and jorge because it wouldn't have been possible uh, uh, if they wouldn't have guided me throughout this journey, because I had a, a slight knowledge of orbital mechanics. And they really helped me not just in the code contributions, but also in the non-code contributions. And yeah, I would also like to say a thank you to them. Yeah, so thank you for this attention. I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Thanks, Yash. My immediate reaction is amazing. I was thinking that uh, 
that you're you know when i heard about event detection i think i was first thinking that it's maybe you know some specific events like the the orbit crossings or so but what you have presented here is basically you're covering everything that is relevant to space operations and that uh, flight dynamic department at ESOC, for example, that they're producing. So like uh, the eclipse events and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the uh, orbit crossings, the orbit anomaly. So it's really exhaustive. And uh, well, I I'm really interested to, maybe we could run an, uh, a comparison test um, uh, for the cluster mission, which is going into eclipse in the spring and the autumn each year. And uh, Flight Dynamics is predicting those events when we're going to into eclipse, and then we have to prepare them and the, the satellites and recover them after they come out from eclipse. So we get from Flight Dynamics the, the timings of these events. And it would be interesting that if we provide you the orbits of those satellites and, the, and uh, yeah, if you could kind of you know, to compare those values and see, because we actually see the, the reality, it's not a simulation. We see that the satellite's being powered off and don't receive any sunlight anymore. And in fact, uh, some while ago, we had to correct, uh, we had the, the radius of the Earth taken into this uh, calculation, but it turned out that the eclipse events were always a bit off from the prediction. And it turned out that uh, we had to account also for the atmosphere. So we added a 20 kilometer uh, radius to the Earth, artificial radius, and then it worked. So, yeah. So polyastro has a, a whole lot of different atmospheric models. So apart from the standard two body problem, we could add a, a whole lot of uh, uh, this atmospheric models and then probably get uh, closer to real life situation. Very good. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, Milenko is asking uh, if this has already been integrated in Polyastro. Yeah, this has already been uh, integrated in Polyastro. It's in the early stages uh, right now, and it is probably also bound to change. But yeah, we have we had a release yesterday of Polyastro, so it's now you can just do pip install, and you would uh, have this uh, event ready. Ah, okay. Great, just in time. Yeah. Uh, M1 is asking or saying that it's a good presentation and how's your planning for the re-entry control? Uh, for the? For the re-entry prediction. Uh, uh, re-entry prediction, is it for the Eclipse one? Uh, re-entry control, it even says, so um, maybe you have to interpret, uh, you're free, free to interpret the question as okay. you like. Uh, also, yeah, re-entry, atmospheric oh, re-entry. Oh, yeah, that can also be done in principle. So whether, uh, for example, if you have a satellite uh, far away from the planet, uh, its atmosphere, then, uh, yeah, we could, in principle, be able to do that. Uh, there should be there will be some sort of a uh, factor that would help us uh, sort it out in that sense. Okay, then also I mean I mentioned uh, Eclipse, but Fernando is also asking about uh, just um, like the AOS and LOS, so the visibility of ground stations. I assume this is also possible to calculate. Yeah, in fact, uh, we are working on this. Uh, it's uh, we have uh, we are working on some. Uh, we are working on this event detection, but we are facing with some edge cases because of which uh, we couldn't uh, do this. And that's, that was observed while validating against Oracle. Uh, we, we found out that uh, the event detection times were matching uh, well, almost 99%. There were just 1% of cases where it doesn't match. So yeah, we are working on that. And this ground station visibility, is, uh, visibility event uh, is soon to be merged, expected to be merged. Okay, very good. Thank you.